Hi, I'm Ananya Manavadhyay and I'm a grad student at Syracuse University working with Eric Coughlin and Chris Nixon, who's our collaborator at Leeds. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the peak of the fallback rate from TDEs and their dependence on stellar type. So as you can see, this was done in collaboration with a lot of students from our group and Eric and Chris, of course. And among them, Julia Fancher and Daniel Paradiso are also in the conference. They have posters which you can check out. Uh, the paper was published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters earlier this year, and the QR code takes you to the published version of the paper. So I've taken here a set of light curves which were observed by the ZTF. This is from the paper by Erica Hammerstein. So if you stare at any of these light curves or the set of all of these on the left, what you'll see that they, what you see is that they peak and rise, uh, they rise and peak on a time scale of something like 30 to 50 days. And here I've just singled out one of those light curves, again from the same paper, to highlight the peak luminosity is attained on a time scale of something like 50 days. And what we are trying to address in this paper is what determines this peak time scale associated with TDE light curves and whether we can correlate these with stellar or black hole parameters or a combination of all of those. So to do that, one way that we can approach the problem is to do hydro simulations of the disruption of a star. And this, show, this movie shows the hydro simulation uh, for the disruption of a one solar mass star by a million solar mass black hole, so a very standard TD. And you see the star being disrupted. This is a partial TD, so a core reforms later. And uh, so we measure the fallback rate of this tidally disrupted stellar debris onto the supermassive black hole which to zeroth order should be responsible for accretion. And you can sort of hand wave it as being the accretion luminosity from this process. So the thing about studying or using these hydro simulations to study the uh, properties of stellar structure, or the effect of stellar structure on peak luminosities, et cetera, is that these hydro simulations are expensive and it's really difficult to just do an exhaustive study of stellar parameters uh, for determining something like the peak time scale. So what we often find useful is to use analytical approximations, which make some simplifying assumptions, but churn out a number like the peak time scale, which is much easier than running a, hydro simulation, a large number of hydro simulations. So the frozen in approximation is probably one of the earliest of the TD models to exist. It goes back to the Lacey et al. 1982 paper and also Loretta et al. 2009. So uh, the cartoon that I have here, shows a star which is initially at large distances from the black hole, perfectly hydrostatically balanced. So it's a perfect sphere. And then as it comes on its parabolic trajectory on the uh, close to the black hole, it starts getting more and more distorted as it comes within the tidal sphere of the black hole. And as it reaches the pericenter, uh, this is where the energy distribution is, like, that is established at the pericenter is assumed to be frozen in. And so the particles which are constituting the star uh, will thereafter evolve on ballistic trajectories in the potential of the black hole. So to get this condition for uh, the star being destroyed, what, uh, the star being destroyed at the tidal radius, what is usually done is you equate the self-gravity of the star at its surface to the tidal field of the black hole. And that yields the expression for tidal radius that I have in the box equation here, uh, which depends on the mass of the star, the mass of the black hole, and the stellar radius. So then uh, using this, Loretto, King, and Pringle in 2009 uh, came up with a prescription to calculate things like fallback rates given any stellar structure. And to test how well this prescription works, what we can do is compare the frozen in predictions to hydro simulations. So this shows the fallback rate obtained from the hydro simulation for one of the simplest types of stars that you can create. So you have a one solar mass star with one solar radius, which is uh, created with the polytropic equation of state. So polytropic equation of state is just uh, an equation of state where pressure is proportional to the density within the star to the power gamma. And for a monoatomic gas like hydrogen, gamma is taken to be 5 thirds. So when you create a stellar structure like this and throw it at a million solar mass black hole and simulate the disruption process, you can calculate the fallback rate. And the plot on the left goes back to 1989. This is from the Evans and Kochanik paper. They calculated the fallback rate for the disruption of a polytropic star like this. Uh, and they used a particle resolution of like 10,000 particles. The plots on the right 
the one shown in black is uh, the simulation, hydro simulation of the same star. This was uh, performed by Eric and Chris in 2015. So they used like a million particle resolution for the same thing, but then you can see the fallback rate on the left and the one on the right, the black ones are pretty well in agreement with one another. So the simulation is converged. And then if we compare the prediction of this with the, that of the frozen in uh, prediction that I talked about earlier, then and specifically we're comparing the peaks. So if you look at the peak time scale, which is the x-intercept, the frozen in is in agreement with the hydro simulation to within a factor of two, which is not that bad. So that can lead us to conclude that doing all these expensive hydro simulations is not that necessary. You can just use the frozen approximation and calculate uh, properties of the effects of the stellar structure on fallback rate. But when you try to do this, as in compare the frozen in model with the hydro simulations for more realistic stellar structures created using uh, stellar evolution code like MESA. Again, I'll be using TAMS, MAMS, and TAMS quite frequently, but our previous speakers from today have introduced those terminologies, so I'm just drawing from that. So uh, on the top left panel, I have the comparison of the frozen in uh, approximation with the hydro simulation. So the solid green curve shows the fallback rate for the disruption of a 0.4 solar mass damp star uh, by a million solar mass black hole. And the dashed green curve is the frozen in prediction for the same. So you see that the two are pretty well in agreement with one another. But as we increase the mass of the star, so this simulation, the, oops, <laughs> the one solar mass star here uh, is not that well in agreement. Now the frozen in model is discrepant with the hydro simulation by about an order of magnitude. So again, I'm talking about the peak time scale here. So the x-intercept of the dash curve is discrepant with the x-intercept of the solid line by about an order of magnitude. And as you keep increasing the mass of the star, so say if you go to the three solar mass amp star, which is the bottom right panel, you see that this discrepancy just grows and this is now two orders of magnitude. Uh, the frozen in approximation is now two orders of magnitude discrepant. So this suggests that there's something wrong with just using the frozen in model to make predictions about the fallback rates. And so the next question that we ask is, is there an analytical model that does better at this? Uh, this brings us to the CN22 model after Coughlin Nixon 2022. So what they suggested in this paper is that in order to calculate the tidal radius, what we did was we equated the self-gravity of the star at its surface to the tidal field of the black hole, and that gave us the expression for tidal radius. But then self-gravity is not maximized uh, at its surface except if you have a flat density profile. So for a realistic density profile uh, like this, oops, I keep using this. So this is for a, uh, the blue curve here is for a five-thirds polytrope, and then the orangish one is for a four-thirds polytrope. So for the five-thirds polytrope, you see that the value of the gravitational field at its peak is somewhat like two times the value at its surface. But, uh, and this is a good approximation for a low mass star, like the 0.3 solar mass star that is on the other side. Again, this is the gravitational field normalized by the maximum value. And for the four-thirds polytrope, which is a good approximation for the one solar mass star, the gravitational field at its peak is about six times the gravitational field at the surface. And then as you keep increasing the mass of the star, the green curve here is for a three solar mass star. This is not really well represented by one single polytrope. But for this, the gravitational field at the peak uh, or at its core radius, RC, is about 50 times higher than at its surface. So this is suggests that in order to overcome this much higher value of gravitational field at the core, you need to, you need to have the star come much closer to the black hole in order to be completely destroyed. And this in turn yields a new prediction for the tidal radius within which the star must approach for being completely destroyed. So in order to get this ex boxed expression, you equate the tidal field uh, of the black hole to the gravitational field of the star at its core, which is G of RC, and that gives you the expression for tidal radius. Using this, you can now make predictions for quantities like the peak time scale and peak fallback rate. And if you do that, you get this. So this is a uh, comparison of the peak fallback rate as a function of peak time scale for a bunch of different stars and for different models. So the, uh, each marker style is representative of a different star, and the mass of the star is given by its color in the color bar index. So 
So we go from 0.2 solar masses to all the way down to five solar masses. And then these lines are all I guiders. So if you look at these three lines, these are the predictions for the frozen in approximation, the ones at the bottom, and therefore ZAMPs, MAMs, and TAMPs. So the frozen in approximation predicts that as you increase the mass of the star, your peak time scale shifts to lower and lower times, and the peak fallback rate goes down a little bit and then increases a little bit up here. But if you compare the prediction for, let's just pick a star, say the five solar mass zero-ish main sequence star, which is given by this yellow circle here. If you compare the frozen in prediction for its counterpart in the CN22 model, you'll find that the yellow star, which is the ZAMS star, is all the way up here. So this just suggests that these two models are yielding very different predictions for the peak time scale and the peak fallback rate, right? So now if we zoom in to this uh, cluster of points here. So I've zoomed in to show that this peak time scale is attained on a uh, time scale of 15 to 35 days, which is pretty independent of the stellar type. Like there's a very weak dependence on stellar type. And the peak fallback rate uh, scales as somewhat linearly with the mass of the star being disrupted. And I've also just written the Eddington luminosity of a million solar mass black hole is 0.2 solar masses per year. Uh, what is also important to notice in this plot are these triangular markers. The inverted triangles are hydro simulations for zero-age main sequence stars. So if you see an inverted triangle well lined up with a star symbol of the same color, this is basically showing that the CN22 model predictions are very well in agreement with the hydro simulations for the ZAM stars. And similarly for the upright triangles and the clover symbols of the same color agreement between uh, CN22 and hydro simulations which is great. So you can now use this simple analytical model to make predictions about things like the peak time scale and peak luminosity. Uh, so to summarize the slide, the peak time scale is something of the order of 30 days, and this scales as the square root of the mass of the black hole. So if you uh, have a black hole mass of, say, 4 million solar masses like Sal J star, you can multiply these numbers by 2 to get the peak time scales. And all of this is consistent with um, other, a bunch of simulations in literature that we checked them against. So, now we can use this model to make uh, predictions for observations. The first very important one, I think, is in the context of jetted TTEs. So, the, the driving mechanism for jetted TTEs is the subject ongoing of ongoing research. But uh, I think we all agree that we need uh, super Eddington accretion rates for launching relativistic jets in TDEs. And uh, as we show in this, using this model, such super highly super Eddington accretion rates are likely to arise from the disruption of high mass stars. So the Eddington limit for a million solar mass black hole here is very close to zero. But if you need orders of magnitude higher than super Eddington accretion rate, you need to disrupt high mass stars. And then we can correlate the rarity of observation of these jetted TDEs as the rarity of occurrence of high mass stars in our universe because these stars are rare both in the initial mass function as well as because they live shorter lives. And this also yields a likely prediction for star, like host galaxies of shattered TDs. These are likely to be arising in young star forming galaxies where you have more high mass stars around. You can also use this model to make, uh, to infer things about the supermassive black hole mass function, for example. So these plots, both of them show the distribution of peak time scale. The one on the left is uh, we took the, all of the stars that I described above, and then we weighted it with the Krupa IMF. Uh, and then on the right, we weighted it with the Krupa IMF truncated at 1.5 solar masses to approximate a more uh, closer to present day mass function. But independent of the weighting function that we used, we, this just shows that the peak time scale is very tightly, the distribution of peak time scales is very tightly peaked around 30 days. And this scales as the square root of black hole mass. So again, this can be used to infer uh, black hole mass function from TDEs. And this is especially useful as the cadence of surveys increases and you can observe the peak time scale more accurately. Finally, in the context of long duration accretion flares, so I'll specifically be talking about this one event called GSN 069, which is an accretion flare extending over almost more than a decade. 
So this GSN-069 source was initially believed to be arise from the disruption of a high mass star, which is the prediction that you get from the frozen in model. So if you remember, the frozen in model predicts that the disruption of high mass star can lead to peak time scales of 10 to 15 years. But what we show is, irrespective of stellar type, complete disruption of high mass stars cannot lead to 10 to 15 year time scales for the fallback rate. And so the only way that this source can be interpreted as arising from a tidal disruption event is if the disruption is partial and you have some beta dependence there. So the way to verify this is if the fallback rate scales as t to the minus 9 fourth, then uh, this is the characteristic late time scaling for partials. This goes back to the 2019 paper by Hogan Nixon. And uh, this blue curve here shows that this event, the light curve actually does scale as t to the minus 9 fourth. We did not draw on this curve. This is from the Minuti et al. paper. 2023, where this uh, light curve is taken from, uh, which again reasserts the fact that this is a partial TD. So I'll leave my summary and conclusions up here and again point you to the QR code for the paper and I can take any questions. Thanks. I see questions. When you compare your uh, um, peak times to the frozen in uh, approximation, which frozen in approximation are you taking? Because that also depends on the, on the internal structure of the star that is modeled as a polytrope. So which yeah. polytropic index do you take? And are you sure that your uh, density profile that you assume in the polytropic model for the frozen in is actually compatible to the one that you, to the actual star that you're simulating? Right, yeah. So we're using uh, the density profiles that we obtained from MESA to assume that the energy distribution is frozen in at the tidal radius, and then use a t to the minus 5 thirds scaling at late times to obtain fallback rate. But have you checked that the, that the internal density profile of your real star is compatible to the polytropic index that you assume? Uh, so in, in the frozen in approximation. So there's no... Well, in the actual frozen in, you have... You, you, yeah, but it does depend yeah. on the on the polytropic uh, on the polytropic index. Yeah. Oh, that so you are actually using the the, the real density profile and then assuming my uh, my formula to calculate the, the yeah. Okay, that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, this is really good. I feel encouraged that uh, we understand the peak. <laughs> so in a simple way. Um, uh, so uh, my question is, uh, so for this, you did some, uh, you, you did an, this analytic calculation, semi-analytic calculation based on MESA models, and then you did uh, numerical simulations to validate some of these triangles. Yeah. So for the triangles, which uh, impact parameter did you consider, or is it independent oh, of the impact parameter? Right, so when the disruption is complete, the peak time scale and peak luminosity is actually independent of uh, impact parameter. So it, as long as beta is sufficiently large, yeah, exactly. then you, you say that it's... Uh, right, and we can also use this model actually to predict uh, betas for which the disruption would be complete. And that is a plot which is there in the paper. I don't have it in the slides, but yeah. yeah. So beta is large enough that the disruption is complete. I see. Oh, I also, can you go to the figure for GS, GSN 069? Yeah. Um, I know you can fit it with the t to the minus uh, 9 over 4. Yeah, no, we didn't fit this. This is taken from I mean, the paper. I mean, it's possible to fit it there. Right, but yeah. then there's a time scale that's involved, right? Because it's a power law doesn't have a time scale. There's an actual time scale which looks like, you know, like you're saying the hundreds of days, here. right? It will be t over hundreds of days and then t to the, and to the minus 9 over 4, right? Wait, what time scale are you talking so about? So there's a t. But power law is, is dimensional. You have to make it dimensionless. So t right. over a time scale, and that time scale looks like t to the mind, uh, maybe hun several hundred You don't days. have a time scale in, an, uh, in a fit like this. Like even if you scale this, the power law scaling will be the same because you'll scale all the numbers by just a single time scale. I mean, if, if that curve needs to be calculated in some way, if you were to actually calculate that curve, Right, so you can scale. choose like t yeah. to be actual time over t peak to the power minus nine four second. Yeah, there's a T peak, exactly. That's what, that's what I mean. So the T peak is, looks like several hundred days, right? It looks like 
thousand days or so. To be yeah, exactly. Right. So, but your T peak is uh, 30 days, right? But I mean, from the analytic models. Oh, sorry, I'm not. I'm sorry, uh, so I'm not that, asking yeah, in so, a good way. So one of the conditions for our model ha is that the disruption has to be complete. And if you have a partial disruption, then there will be a dependence on, deep, on beta for T peak. But it so won't be so strong of a dependence on beta. It also depends on the black hole mass. So the black hole mass for this is likely higher than. Yeah, but it's a ma black hole mass to the one half power, though. So you want to go from 30 days to, let's say, several hundred days. Right. Um, I'm not sure if you can find a beta and find a black hole mass that no, can make the. The dependence on beta is actually pretty strong. It's not like just going from 30 to 60, for example, the dependence on beta can. Uh, and then also, like if you see this plot as being extrapolated all the way down to beyond uh, zero here. Yeah, but then I'm basically these asking, are not data points. So I'm you basically don't, asking, can you find a star, a tidal disruption event at that actually get the peak time so late, so long, which is several hundred days, and then the partial is TDE? Uh, I think you can for very okay. high mass black holes, but then uh, again in this plot, the peak is not actually, like all of this part uh, is not measured, right? You're just fitting, you're extrapolating this backward. So the only observed data points are here. So I guess if you're asking, can you construct a system where the peak time exactly. scale is right. thousand days? Uh, yeah. I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> I guess you can for high mass black holes, but okay, I will be curious uh, tuning the exact that. parameters, yeah, I'll yeah. have to get back to you on that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. I want to ask one more question about this yeah. object, which is super interesting. Um, if I'm remembering the phone numbers correctly, this is one of the QPE yeah. as well. Um, does, do you uh, run into issues with the QPE interpretation if you have like the partial disruption or LMS star, or is it still kind of too uncertain? Not that, that I know of, because the QPE stuff is not just the t title disruption, I guess, right? The mechanism for that is different. So yeah, I don't think we run into in anything with the QPE interpretation. Yeah. Thanks. Um, let's think and then again. <laughs>